Thanks for taking the time to watch or listen into this message. Our prayer is always that God would use it to draw you closer to himself and deepen your love for Jesus Christ. And if you're new here, consider subscribing to stay up to date with all of our great content. Thanks again for checking out this message. We pray it is a blessing to you. So we are in a series uh, called Romans. As we go through the book of Romans, the letter written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Rome, um, we are in message number 32, I was told today. Um, and we have like two more left. And so my wife joked like, who are we if we're not going through Romans? It's almost over. Uh, we'll, we'll be done with Romans in a couple more weeks. Uh, don't worry, there's many more books in the Bible we're going to do just fine. Um, but uh, if... If you haven't been here up to now, um, we're just grateful that you're here this morning and you're going to be just fine not here in the first 31. But I would encourage you um, to understand things in context. It would be good for you to read Romans. It would be good for you to even maybe listen to the messages. They're on uh, YouTube or you can listen to the podcast um, on your phone. But I, I just think it's beneficial for us to get the full counsel of Scripture. That's actually why we're marching through Romans and, and why we'll work through texts like today that you might not always um, work through in the preaching of, of God's word um, if it's, if it's cherry-picked for what you want. But the way we're going through Romans, we're going to look at all of the text. And so um, if you have a Bible with you, you could go to Romans 15 now. Um, and we're going to read. Actually, let's not read quite yet. Write this down. We plan and pray, but God determines the way. <laughs> Can I get an amen? We plan... And we pray, but ultimately, God determines the way. It's right that we plan. It's right that we pray. We should do those things. We should consider, God, I want to most glorify you. This is the way that seems like the way I could best do so. God, help me bless this way. Let me, let me know that it's your way. I'm going to do your desires and not my own. God, this is what it looks like. This is what it feels like. This is what I'm understanding is the best way for me to honor you. I want to do that. And God, I pray that you would bless it, that you'd be all over it, that things would go well in doing so. And then understand that God's the one that determines the way. How many of you looking back in your life, you don't have to raise your hands because it's going to be all of us have planned a certain way, prayed about a certain way, and it didn't end up that way. Not because you didn't have a plan. Not because you didn't pray about it. But that ultimately, um, it went a different direction. And so Paul is going to walk us through some of that today. And, and before we get into the text and Paul's plan and his prayer requests, um, I want to read two verses in Proverbs about us planning our ways, but God ultimately determining the outcome. Um, in Proverbs 16, verse 9, it says, In their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. Also in Proverbs 19, verse 21, it says, Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. Some of us can look back and just go, praise God. Because our plans and what we were praying um, didn't ultimately happen, and we could even thank God for that. Also, some of us might have some confusion. Because what we planned and prayed for seemed like a good thing, but we went through struggle and pain instead. We asked for blessing, and it felt like suffering. How many know that God's still there with you in that? And that ultimately he has a plan to do a good work in you and to work whatever that even negative thing was out for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his good purpose? Sometimes we're the ones that sabotage the plan and prayer with our own brokenness. Sometimes it's the brokenness of those around us but ultimately, God will even work through that for our ultimate good, 
for those who love him and called according to his purpose. Let's look at the text today. Paul's going to just lay out his plan and a prayer request in that. We're going to start in verse 22 of chapter 15. We're going to work through verse 33. Here it is. This is why I have often been hindered from coming to you. But now that there is no more place for me to work in these regions, and since I have been longing for many years to visit you, I plan to do so when I go to Spain. I hope to see you while passing through and to have you assist me on my journey there after I have enjoyed your company for a while. Now, however, I am on my way to Jerusalem in the service of the Lord's people there. For Macedonia and Achaia were pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the Lord's people in Jerusalem. They were pleased to do it, and indeed they owed it to them, or owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have shared in the Jews' spiritual blessings, they owe it to the Jews to share with them in the material blessings. So after I have completed this task and have made sure that they've received this contribution, I will go to Spain and visit you on the way. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the full measure of the blessing of Christ. I urge you, brothers and sisters, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. Pray that I may be kept safe from the unbelievers in Judea and that the contribution I take to Jerusalem may be favorably received by the Lord's people there so that I may come to you with joy by God's will and in your company be refreshed. The God of peace be with you all. Amen. Write down Paul's plan to visit Rome. So Paul speaks to the Romans, and, and where we're going to pick up today, he just finished saying that I, I long to come to you, but I couldn't because God had a purpose for me, and that was to bring the gospel to unreached people that hadn't heard of him, to take the gospel to the nations. And so he's worked through this area, and he even speaks of the area he's been in, but I haven't been able to come to you because there was still work to be done. I, I hadn't accomplished what I had started doing. And let's look starting in verse 22. This is why I've often been hindered from coming to you. Why? Because the gospel's already reached you, so I don't need to bring it to you originally. And God called me to reach the nations that had not heard the gospel yet. And so he's worked through an area, and he's established churches in those areas. He's proclaimed the good news in those areas. He's even established leaders in those areas to continue to push the gospel into the, the, the far reaches of those areas. But now that there is no more place for me or room for me to work in these regions, and since I have been longing for many years to visit you, I plan to do so when I go to Spain. So we're going to see in a moment that the Paul's ultimate goal, he wants to see the Roman church, but he wants to see them kind of love on them, be blessed by them, only so we can go beyond them. Paul's always thinking, wow, you already have Jesus. I'll, I'll give you some good words. I'll, I'll, I'll preach the gospel to you so they might be encouraged, that the, the word would wash over you, that the church would be strengthened. But ultimately, I want to go beyond you because there's somebody else I need to tell about Jesus. I love the body, and I'm concerned for those outside. And so he says, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. My plan is to go to Jerusalem, give them a com contribution that I've collected, or that has been collected for the poor there, and then I'm going to go to Spain, and on my way, I'm going to stop by, and I'm going to say hi, because I've been longing to see you for many years. And it's not going to be on the screen, but back in Romans chapter 1, in 9 and 10, he said this, God, whom I serve in my spirit and preach in the gospel of his son, is my witness how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times, and I pray that now, at last, by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to you. He has a plan and he prays and ultimately says, this is what I want, God. This is what my hope is. And I, and I hope that it aligns with your will for what the outcome is. But if I don't get there, it's because God had something else for me to do. It doesn't mean that I don't plan just because God's will can supersede my will. I still plan. I still pray, God, let the desires of my heart be the desires of your heart because that's what I want to do. But I know that I, I, it's best and that I, ultimately I will do what you plan for me to do. So he's planned for years. He's hoped to see the church in Rome, to, to bless those there and to be blessed by them. His work is done in the regions that he's in. Since I've been longing for many years to visit you, I plan to do so when I go to Spain. <clears throat> 
I hope to see you while passing through and to have you assist me on my journey there after I have enjoyed your company for a while. So he wants to, um, and we'll see it in a little while if, when we look back at chapter one, um, it, he wants to bless each other in the faith, be encouraged by each other. He also hopes that they can assist on his journey. He's a missionary and he needs people to resource the mission, to help push the gospel forward in the world. And so sometimes that means that he'll show up somewhere and go like, hey, I'm going to need a couple of your people. These people, they should come with me. Let's pray over them and have them come with me. Sometimes it means like, hey, why don't you um, put together some resources so that you can financially push the gospel forward into the region that we're going. It's wrong to understand, like, we're going to get this in the middle of it too. I keep preaching ahead of myself a little bit. But, but Paul was a tent maker. Paul worked with his hands to often finance the preaching of the gospel. But you need to understand that that's not the only way that Paul's mission was funded. In fact, Paul realized that he had the right, and was even commanded by God that those that preach the gospel should receive their, their due from the gospel, be financially taken care of from the gospel, but he said he chose not to because for those that he was preaching to, it would hinder their hearing. And so there were places that he went that he did work with his hands, and, and he covered his expenses through working and doing tent making and then would go and preach the gospel. But hold on for a second. That's not the way that it says everybody should do it. In fact, when a couple of his disciples showed up, he quit making tents. Because it says when they showed up, they could work and they could finance the mission. So Paul stops making tents so that he can continue to do what he's best at doing and push forth the gospel every day in the community. And here he says, I'm going to go beyond you to Spain. That's my hope. That's my goal. That's my plan by God's will. And I hope that you would assist me in that journey. Hmm. Just wonder, are we ready to assist those that are on God's mission in, in fulfilling his purpose? Oftentimes we can get really inward focused so that we're not prepared to assist those um, who are on God's purpose. Let's make sure we always stay open-handed. Let's make sure we don't only save for our own good. But that even what we are frugal about, we steward well, we always keep open-handed. God, what would you have me do with this? Now, however, I am on my way to Jerusalem in the service of the Lord's people there. It's going to there to serve them, specifically to bring them something. For Macedonia and Achaia were pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the Lord's people in Jerusalem. Okay, so a bunch of people get saved in Jerusalem. Like thousands are added to the church at the day of Pentecost. Many of those people were there specifically for this festival. And so when they get saved, a lot of them don't go home. And so there's lots of people that have needs in that area, in fact, we see the early church contributing and caring for each other in mighty and massive ways, even selling property and land to take care of those that are in need. Well, not only is it that there's an influx of these believers that might not have gone home, but there's, there's famine that happens in that time, there's brokenness that happens in that time, and there's many poor among the primarily Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. Paul has a heart for them. He understands that we are all brothers and sisters in Christ, and the church is bigger than just the church, uh, the, 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 the local gathering. That there's the little C church that all of us are called to be a part of, a local congregation where we share, and we fellowship, we one another, and we uh, each other each other. But there's also the big C ch church, all believers that have put their faith in Jesus. And we should have a heart that extends beyond just ourselves. Yes, we should love each other well, and we should realize we are part of a greater family that might have need beyond our own. Hmm. Our heart should break for our brothers and sisters that are, are persecuted or that are in a season of famine wherever they live in the world. And they should break enough that we actually do something about it. And these churches do. In fact, they were pleased to do it. I want to show you that. Um, 
I want to show you those two churches specifically. The generosity of the church in Macedonia and the generosity of the church in Achaia. And I wrote this down because when it said that Macedonia and Achaia were pleased to make a contribution for the poor, the word contribution there, it's an interesting um, translation because the word contribution is koinonia. It's, it's the word fellowship. It's common share is the literal translation. The com- contribution is this common share. And what it means is that these churches in, in different places, far from Jerusalem, realize that those are my people. That is my family. And I have a common share. I am invested in them. They are invested in me. We care for each other so that when I have and they don't, I move so that we do. And that if they have and I don't, they move so that we do. Koinonia is this common sharing of the blessing, of the pain, like we're supposed to do with each other. As we get to know each other and walk this thing out together, we're, we're to do even more broadly to the fellowship at large. I want to show you that this is true. Paul says that he's got these contributions from these two churches and the generosity of the church in Macedonia in 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 5. Paul writes to the church in Corinth and he says, and now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches, this region of churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, this is this verse, in the midst of a very severe trial, so things are hard, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. That's not normally the equation you would think of for rich generosity. You wouldn't necessarily think, okay, severe trial, overflowing joy, and extreme poverty. That they over, they're in a hard time, but they have great overflowing joy while they work through extreme poverty, but it moved them to rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. So these churches hear about the brokenness and the poor of the believers in Jerusalem. And even though they have extreme poverty, they're overflowing with joy and they're pleading with Paul, like, let us help. Let us help. They have, uh, they're grateful to be able to help. Says, to the extent that they were able, and even beyond that, out of their own, they weren't forced to do it. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves, first of all, to the Lord, and then by the will of God, also to us. Hmm. So he says, when Paul tells the church in Rome about what he is bringing to Jerusalem, um, he's verifying that they are, they're happy to give. They contributed greatly. And too often we think that those that contribute greatly are, or are richly generous are those that just have an overflow of abundance. He says, no, it's the one that had the overflow of joy. They actually were in extreme poverty, if you really knew. But their heart was so great that they were moved with compassion. And they, all the way to a place of rich generosity for those that were broken, that were their fellow believers. He'll go on um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. And I I encourage you to read chapter 8 and 9 in 2 Corinthians because you'll get a fuller grasp of Paul talking about these two churches contributing. The generosity of the church in Achaia. To the church in Corinth, he says, there is no need for me to write to you about this service to the Lord's people. So he's already said, Macedonians, man, they gave like crazy to take care, even above themselves, beyond our expectations. For I know your eagerness to help, and I have been boasting about it to the Macedonians, telling them that since last year, you in Achaia, well, hold on for a second. 
So actually, when he's writing to the church in, in Corinth, that's the church in Achaia. So when you see that in Romans, know that that's the church in Corinth. So there's the Macedonian churches and there's the Corinthian churches. That's the, the church in Achaia. And it's this region. And so there's these churches. And he says, listen, in 1 Corinthians, he writes and says, prepare this offering for me to come get and take. In 2 Corinthians, he says, make sure you're ready because we're coming to get it. He says, the Macedonians already gave. They beat you to it. We already went there. And when we were in Macedonia, we told them, the church in Achaia, they've been preparing. They're getting ready. They, are, they were boasting. Like, this church is going to give beyond themselves to care for the broken. And so that helped compel the Macedonian church even in their overflowing joy and extreme poverty to give generously. Telling them that since last year, you and Achaia were ready to give. And your enthusiasm has stirred most of them to action. How cool is that? Their enthusiasm is contagious. Think about that. Sometimes we serve or we give begrudgingly, which doesn't compel people to have the correct heart and do it out of a right place. It looks like we didn't want to do it in the first place. And to that I say, let's get our hearts right. But these churches, it's, it's so cool. They feed off one another. He says, I told the church in Macedonia about your willingness and your excitement. I boasted about your preparation in being able to, to give generously. And because of that, they were stirred to go above and beyond. And now he's speaking back to them saying, but the church in Macedonia, man, they gave greatly. Now you go ahead and do it too. There's this enthusiasm back and forth about let's encourage each other to do right in glorifying God and caring for his people. And then as we go on, um, generosity is encouraged all the more. And, and we see it here starting verse 6. And, and, um, it's not the primary reason of the text today, so I'm not going to read you all of, we could read beyond verse 7 really easily. But he, he, in, in reminding them about their giving and making sure that their heart is right, he doesn't want them to just uh, compete with the other church. He wants them to be encouraged. There's a difference. If I'm just doing it so I can say, look what I did. Look, I did it greater than you. I went above and beyond. And boasting in what I've accomplished, then I've missed it. And so he reminds them, you were excited. Make sure your heart's still right in what you're about to do. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. He says, we're going to come collect this thing. We're going to bring it to Jerusalem, and, and we want to make sure that your heart is right in giving it. Don't give it because you just have to. Don't give it just because the Macedonians did. Give it because your heart is right. Give it, give it because you made a decision to do so. And I want to share something with you. This was beyond the, a lot of their regular giving. This was giving to a need. And so like the church in Macedonia said, he gave himself first to the Lord, and then he gave himself to us by God's will. That their first priority with all of their lives, not just their finances, was to make an offering unto God. And that in doing so, they would also care for the Lord's people. And then Paul would remind all of us to give out of a cheerful place and with gratitude. Have you ever received a gift that somebody didn't want to give you? <laughs> yeah, here you go, man. I guess I, I drew your name. <laughs> Christmas is coming. Come on, you've been there, right? No? Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> where you might, like, you don't even want to open it? Like, if their heart's not right, you're like, ah, man, keep it. Like, it's cool, man. Return it or something. That's real. We do that. And yet we think that we could, or that it would be all right to offer unto God. Begrudgingly. Here, God, I guess you want this. <laughs> okay, let's keep moving. 
Go back to the Romans text for me if you could. Of course you could. You're awesome. They were pleased to do it. Now check this out. And indeed, they owe it to them. What? They owe it to them? You just said, like, they they gave out of a cheerful heart. They were excited to do so. They gave out of an overflow of joy and extreme poverty, and it it welled up in a rich generosity. Generosity, this is this, this giving heart, and they did it cheerfully. They were pleased to do it, and indeed, they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles or the nations have shared in the Jews' spiritual blessings, they owe it to the Jews, and specifically this is the Jewish Christians, to share with them their material blessings. You know, that's not a, that's not a unique um, idea. Paul talks about that idea in, in other places. Um, and I spoke about it a minute ago with his tent making, and just the idea of a spiritual blessing being returned with a material blessing. Now, this might sound interesting to you because we don't take a tithes and offering here. Like, we don't do, I mean, we, we have a box out there for people to give. But in the length of our existence <laughs> as a church, we haven't done, like, here's the five minute spiel. Um, I don't know if we've ever even passed buckets. Maybe we did when we first started a couple times. But even then, there wasn't a spiel. It was just like, hey, a bucket's passing by. Do what you do. And it's not because we're afraid to say that the Bible is very clear that we should be generous with our finances. In fact, when the Bible speaks on it, when we work through it, we address it. We just aren't in this just to talk to you about your money all the time. The Bible does say to be very generous. It says to take care of the needs of of the church, of the people, even of those that preach the gospel. Hmm. It's always weird to say that as the guy preaching the gospel. (laughs) But it's right. It's clear in the text. And Paul has this idea. Now now listen, when he writes to Timothy, he says, some people think that this is all about godliness is for financial gain. And those people proclaim things so that they will be ble- They do it for the reason of a material blessing. That's wrong. But for those that do it to bless spiritually others, that it is right for them to receive. Hmm. This isn't a concept that's strictly left here in Romans. As he says, through the, the Jews, through uh, the the pushing forth of the gospel through the Savior coming through the Jewish line. You were blessed spiritually. Now turn around and bless those that have blessed you. He talks about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, the sharing of spiritual blessings and material blessings. In 1 Corinthians, that next one there. There we go. It says, who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat its grapes? Who tends a flock and does not drink the milk? Do I say this merely on human authority? Doesn't the law say the same thing? Now, Paul, right before this, will say like, hey, how come some people get to take a wife with them on this journey? How come some of them are getting paid when they're out there doing something and like they can take care of their family? And you guys make it seem like me and Barnabas, we can't bring a wife along. You don't want to take care of us. Like Paul is like speaking to the, the facts. Doesn't the law say the same thing? For it is written in the law of Moses, do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. Is it about oxen that God is concerned? Surely he says this for us. Doesn't he? Yes, this was written for us. Because whoever plows and threshes threshes, should be able to do so in the hope of sharing in the harvest. If we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much? If we reap a material harvest from you, if others have this right of support from you, shouldn't we have it all the more? But we did not use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. So what Paul is saying is that others continue to go around and you take care of them because they're taking care of you. Now listen, this is not me making a money grab or saying that I need something. I'm a full-time employee of the Roos Community Church. I've been blessed since day one. 
that our church has been generous. And, and listen, I, I planned originally to be bivocational because I didn't know how I would be able to do it in starting a church. But at the very beginning, the leadership team around us said, Russ, we want you to do this and go all in on this. And so I don't know if you know this, I used to be a youth pastor making a couple bucks. And when we started this church, by the grace of God, the Holy Spirit moved in my heart and my wife's because I went to her with a less than one-year-old. In fact, he was about nine months old. And I said, babe, then God is calling us to start a church. And she said, me too. I didn't know that was going to be the answer. And she knew what that meant, that I was about to quit my job. And she was working part-time with a nine-month-old. You got to hear from God on those. Don't just go do that. So I started applying for jobs and even had interviews. And in one, they said, like, will you be willing to, to work out of town a little bit? And I said, I can't. I'm planting a church here. And in doing that, leadership team came to me and they said, listen, we think that with an, we have just enough families to um, pay you what you were making as a youth pastor. So at least you can make what you were making because we want you to go all in on this thing. And since day one, we've been blessed to be able to do that. Yeah. And thank God I make a little more than I did as a youth pastor for sure. <laughs> But, but listen, so this is not me trying to like do something for me. I just want you to see the principle. Because there are some people that are pouring into your life that are doing it just to bless you spiritually. And it is reaping a harvest in your life and a benefit in your family, in your career, in everything that you do. And it might be time for you to bless them back. Good. I'm not saying that because I expect, I expect something from you, but I'm expecting you to have the heart to bless those that bless you. Don't you know that those who serve in the temple get their food from the temple and that those who serve at the altar share in what is offered at the altar or on the altar? In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. The Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. That means that the Lord's people are to take care of those that preach the gospel to them. And you guys do a great job of it. So again, this is not a, a, a con- condemnation at all. This is like a yay God. But I want us to be reminded of it in all areas of our life. In fact, I think back of those that preach the gospel to me, and now I'm feeling compelled even as I'm preaching this message, that maybe I could go back and bless them. Because how cool is it that they would pour themselves out? They gave of their time, their study, their life, to help me get to where I get to do this today, help you get to where you're at today. Hmm. We need to go back to the Romans text again. Oh, man, I better start moving a little faster than this. So after I have completed this task and have made sure that they have received this contribution, I will go to Spain and visit you on the way. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the full measure of the blessings of Christ. And some manuscripts say the full measure of the blessings of the gospel of Christ. He says, when I come to you, I'm bringing the gospel. I'm coming with the fullness of the blessings of God. He understands that no matter how he comes, that's how Paul shows up regardless. Paul could show up in chains. Paul could show up doing well. And he's going to come in the fullness with with everything he has to bless you with, with Jesus and with the gospel. So Paul has now laid out his plan. We see kind of the timeline and the history of what he's he's doing at the time. Um, And then he brings these prayer requests. Look at this in Romans 15, starting verse 30. I urge you, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters. This is a big appeal. Listen to what he appeals by. By our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit. I appeal to you by the Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit. That's a big appeal to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. It's interesting. Paul's talking about these amazing things. I have these great contributions that people gave out of a great big heart beyond my expectations. I'm going to bless these people, and it's a struggle. I'm I'm going to come to you in the full blessings of Christ. Struggle with me. He, He understands that those two aren't separate. They don't have to be. Did you hear me? You could be walking out, 
perfectly the will of God for your life, the purposes of God for your life, the plan of God for your life, according to his commands and his will. You're walking in his ways. You're doing what he's compelled you to do. And as you're going, it's a blessing. And you get to do mighty things that, that, that just fill your heart and, and fulfill you inside. And in that, it can still be hard. And so Paul's doing these great things, and it's a struggle. And he says, join me in my struggle. And, and, and he, he specifies how to do so. And when he says, join me in my struggle, he doesn't say, like, hop on a boat or what, come, visit, come with me. Specifically, he says, join me in my st- struggle. How? By praying. By praying. Hmm. Join me in my struggle by praying? Yeah. There is a struggle. I'm, I'm, I'm longing to accomplish something, to bring this to be a blessing, also that I, that I could go to Spain and preach the gospel, that I could see you on the way. Like, it's not going to be easy, and you could join me in this. You didn't need to contribute in that way because other, other people already did, but you can be a part of this, and you can be a part of this by praying. And so often when we're about to do something mighty in God or we're trying to accomplish something in God, we do say like, hey, listen, the baseline minimum of how you can partner in this is prayer. It's, it's bigger than a baseline minimum. He says, I'm, I need, can you struggle with me? Join me in my struggle. It's the idea of like, you struggle with me, but the way you're going to do it is through prayer. And I just wonder, do we really wrestle in prayer like that? Well, I take on your burden in my prayers. And I don't mean just in a quick prayer request on a the, on the flyby. But do I take it on like you're taking it on? You're taking on the doing of and you're praying about it. Am I going in, in that kind of depth to my struggle in prayer for you on your behalf and joining you as you struggle? Or am I doing the quick like, yeah, I got you, bro. God's blessing. I think we need to understand a deeper depth to prayer. We do it fly by. We, we, why not? Why not come before God earnestly, confidently, in awe, and bring to him our requests with all of our might? Join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. And he has a specific thing he wants prayed. Pray that I may be kept safe from the unbelievers in Judea and that the contribution I take to Jerusalem may be favorably received by the Lord's people there so that I may come to you with joy by God's will and in your company be refreshed. So check this out. Pray that I may be kept safe. He has a specific prayer request. Struggle with me, pray for me, and pray this. It's very clear on what he's asking. Pray that I may be kept safe from the unbelievers in Judea. Here's something cool. This is a cool thing in the text here. He's writing it to the Romans, but in Acts, we can actually see it taking place. So Paul has these, these, in in, in, uh, Corinthians, we can see the ask. Like we can see him going to get the contributions. In Acts, we can see him bringing them to Jerusalem and asking to be kept safe. It's kept safe. And so uh, he says, being kept safe from the unbelievers in Acts 23, 11. So Paul goes there, brings the contribution, but then he's arrested and it doesn't look like things are going well. It looks as if his, the struggling in prayer is, is not going to um, have an answer of yes. It looks like he's going down. But he's visited the following night The Lord stood near Paul and said, take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. So he's in Jerusalem. He's taken into prison. And you would think, well, he wasn't kept safe then because he's in prison. But after the Lord tells him you're going to Rome, what happens is there is a plot to kill Paul. That plot gets figured out and exposed. And Paul is taken safely away from Jerusalem. And so even though he's in chains, he is safe from the unbelievers. And so again, so although it doesn't look like at first that maybe that prayer was answered, it was definitely answered with a yes and amen. 
Maybe that was the safest way to take him out of Jerusalem, was under guard at the proper time, away from those that set an oath to kill him. And he says also, pray for me that the offering will be received favorably by the saints there in Acts 24, verse 17, when Paul is um, being his own or, or speaking a witness before uh, Governor Felix. He says, after an absence of several years, I came to Jerusalem to bring my people gifts for the poor and to present an offering. It seems as though it was received, that Paul showed up, brought those offerings, and that they were received because it wasn't those people that came after him, the other ones did. I want to say this. Uh, can we go back to the Romans text? So that I may come to you with joy. His goal is, let this all happen well, so that I may come to you with joy by God's will. That's the Lord willing. My hope is to go to Jerusalem, have it go well. The unbelievers I'll be kept safe from. The believers will receive this favorably. And that I would be able to now journey to Spain through Rome, that I could spend time with you. You would bless me. I would bless you. And we, I would go on from there proclaiming the good news. That's his plan. But he also understands, like, that's my plan, and I submit it to God. That's my, listen, pray for me, because that's what I want to do. But ultimately, it's unto God. Sometimes you get what you prayed and planned for in a different way than you expected. Sometimes you get what you prayed and planned for in a different way than you expected. Plan Paul hoped to come see them, and he thought that he would be doing it on a missionary journey to Spain. Instead, he would do it as a prisoner that was shipwrecked and then taken there as a prisoner. And in Acts, we can see that. 28, 16, it says, when we got to Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. So Paul as a prisoner, has a space of his own, but he's guarded. At the very end of Acts, chapter 28, verse 30 and 31, it says, for two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. He rented this place. He was still a prisoner, but he was able to proclaim the good news. He got to do what he hoped to do, bring the gospel to Rome on his own. And so although it doesn't look like the way that he asked for it when he first wrote to the Romans, he gets to go there, have a place of his own, proclaim the good news. In fact, in fact people would come to him hearing that Paul was there and he would proclaim the gospel. Now, Paul... Um, would eventually be released from prison. And we don't know exactly where he went. Some scholars think that maybe he did get to go to Spain to preach the gospel. But there's no super accurate proof that that happened. But we know his intent was to do so. How many know that uh, believers aren't ever called to retire in proclaiming the gospel? So we should always have a plan. So we should die with a plan we haven't accomplished. Did you hear me? Like we should die thinking about, man, tomorrow I hope I get to go tell so-and-so about Jesus. So whether he got to go to Spain or not, Paul always had a plan to proclaim the gospel again tomorrow and later today, as it's still coming out of his mouth right now. And so should we. So should we. Maybe we won't go to the extent of where Paul went, but we are called to let people know the good news. We are called to remind each other that our believers of the good news of Jesus Christ, and we are called to plan to continue to go out and, and tell people beyond there. And, and when we make those plans, we aren't to boast in them. In fact, um, in James, and I just wrote down, we make our plans, but it's up to God's purpose. In James 4, 13 through 15, it says, now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Feeling pretty good about your life? <laughs> Gone. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, 
we will live and do this or that. He doesn't say that you shouldn't have a plan and that you shouldn't want to do it. But this comes into alignment with Paul, how Paul says it. I have this plan. Would you pray that I would be able to accomplish that plan? And ultimately, it'll have to be God's will or it won't happen at all. But I'm going to go after it. What an awesome way to go about it. I need the worship team to come up. To go about our lives. There's a couple things I want you to consider before we look at the very last part of Romans 15 there, verse 33. Um, Do you have a plan? We have planners. We have schedules. Do you have a plan on how to glorify God? By the proclamation of the good news of Jesus Christ. We plan retirements. Plan where our kids will go to school. We plan our week out. In that week, where's the plan? Where's the plan that you could ask somebody to pray with you because you're trying to do something beyond yourself in the proclaiming of Jesus Christ? Where are you trying to take the gospel that you need others to struggle with you in prayer? You, not only do we, we oftentimes have a weak prayer life, we're not struggling with other people, but oftentimes that's because nobody's doing anything to struggle for the pushing forward of the gospel. Most of our prayers are for comfort. They're for comfort. Listen, I'm not a, I want God to bless you. I just am not sticking God in the box to think that some other things might be a blessing. Sometimes what we think is a blessing is actually an abundance that will pull our attention away from God and drown out our faith. I don't know if you heard that. I want you to strive to steward everything God's given you. He's given you gifts. He's given you abilities. Some of you have the ability to, to like create wealth in massive ways. You should do so to honor God. And you shouldn't just do that to honor God. You should consider, God, where in my life, in my schedule, am I planning, am I even considering where I will go and how I will preach Jesus? And listen, not everybody's called to stand up on a stage or or stand out on a corner or, 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 or do like Paul did. But every single person is called to take the gospel to the nations. And it starts with your neighbor starts with your family that are unbelievers. It's holiday season. You're going to be around some people that don't know Jesus. If you're not around people that don't know Jesus, you need to meet more people. There's this amazing thing that happens that as more people around us follow Jesus or as we start making great relationships among believers, it gets really comfortable. And so we kind of push away from unbelievers. Praise God. Praise God that a believer wasn't scared to be too close to me or you. Consider that. That our role, our mission, our purpose is to glorify God with everything we have. Let us be a generous people. Let us be those that pray big for each other. Who are you struggling in prayer with? And what are you doing that someone can struggle with you in prayer for? And then ultimately, let's give it all to God. It's his will. The last part of this says, the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Paul has prayer requests for himself, but also he's requesting something for them. May the God of peace be with you all. That's so awesome. I just wrote down, when the God of peace is with you, you have the peace of God. When the God of peace is with you, he says, the God of peace be with you. Many of us want the peace of God without the God of peace with us. Did you hear that? We want the God of peace over there, but we want the peace of God here. Hmm. May the God of peace be with you all. And that peace 
speaks of that's, that's shalom. It's a, it's a regular greeting of like peace to you. God's peace be with you. And that peace is, is, is this idea of things being in right place and order and alignment. And the only way that happens is if the first thing is in order and that is God above all. There is one God. We're to love him with all of our hearts, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. That's where peace comes from having the God of peace with us. Can you stand to your feet?